So hi, everyone. My name is Michaela Jackson. I am the Program Director of Prevention Policy here at the Hepatitis B Foundation. And today we have a really great webinar set up for you all talking about best practices for implementing universal hepatitis B screening and vaccination guidelines. So just a few logistics before we get into the presentations today. Um, for those of you who are participating, all attendees are on mute. You can feel free to leave any comments or questions in the chat or in the Q&A box. And we will be sure to do Q&A at the end and um, all of your questions will be answered. If we don't get to them, you can also send follow up. And this session is being recorded. And so everybody will receive a recording as well as the slides. So just a little bit about uh, who is hosting today. Hepatitis B, uh, Foundation and Hep B United are a national nonprofit group who focus on eliminating hepatitis B in the United States and globally. Uh, Hep B United is a national coalition that's made up from many diverse uh, other coalitions on the ground who work within communities every single day to fight viral hepatitis and hepatitis B specifically. And as you can see, we have a very large following across the United States. And so we have a lot of great resources available to anybody who needs them. I also just wanted to do a quick plug right before uh, we got into our presentations today about a very exciting opportunity that we have coming up called Hepatitis B Community Health Center Learning Collaborative. It is kicking off on June 28th um, in a virtual setting and the audience is community-based health centers, FQHCs, and or non FQHCs who work within the Asian American, Pacific Islander, Native Hawaiian, African immigrant communities, or drug using communities, with the goal of improving the capacity to implement hepatitis B education, screening, vaccination, and kids to care programs. So if anybody's interested in learning more about that or being involved, you can apply by June 9th. The link is in the chat and on the screen as well. And we will be selecting two participants from each organization um, who will be compensated for their time as well. So feel free to ask any questions if you're interested in any more. So today, as I mentioned, we're going to be talking about universal hepatitis B screening uh, and vaccination implementation and some best practices on how to do it. So in addition to myself, we have two very uh, fantastic panelists uh, with us today. So first is Lisa Bade from uh, Spartan Ash, and then we have Dr. Sue Wong uh, from Cooperman Barnabas Medical Center, and they will be uh, going in more in depth in their presentations about some of the things that I'm going to be discussing first. So to kick us off, I'm going to talk a little bit about the Hepatitis B Foundation's uh, call to action that we recently put out on eliminating the hepatitis B virus through universal screening and vaccination. So as a bit of background, we have two new updated hepatitis B guidelines. Um, first is the vaccination one and the second is screening. And essentially these recommendations came about because risk-based guidelines were not successful. We've had them for many decades. Um, and as you can see by the numbers on this page, they just were not doing what they needed to do. They were burdened to physicians, they were burdened to patients, and they were not capturing the people who were at risk. Uh, additionally, impacted communities faced uh, significant burdens to hepatitis B care, and they still do, uh, largely due to a lot of stigma and discrimination that was happening within their communities. The cost of uh, trying to reach these services, especially from uh, immigrants and migrant communities who were trying to access hepatitis B care. And finally, the US is moving towards eliminating viral hepatitis by 2030. So all of these things together really help put us on a path to updating these two new guidelines, uh, updating these guidelines and working towards how to best implement them within uh, the settings across the United States in order to make them as successful as possible. And for those of you who might be newer to the hepatitis B community, we do have some statistics on the uh, side of the screen. So about 2.4 million Americans are living with chronic hepatitis B in the United States with about 67% of people actually unaware of their infection. Uh, moreover, about 70% of adults 19 and older have not completed the hepatitis B vaccination series. So we really have some wide gaps in hepatitis B care that need to be addressed, and that's exactly why we are here today. 
So just as a quick overview, which Lisa will talk a little bit about more, these are the new hepatitis B vaccination guidelines. Uh, they're universal, so meaning that everybody from 19 to 59 should be vaccinated. And then there's a little, a few caveats as well uh, that are listed on the screen. Additionally, the new universal hepatitis C screening recommendations call for universal one-time screening for hepatitis C, all adults 18 and older with periodic testing for all susceptible persons with ongoing risk and anybody who requests a hepatitis C screening test. This is also significant because it updates from just testing from surface antigen to all three, so surface antigen, surface antibody, and um, core antibody for hepatitis B, which puts uh, providers in a really great space to be able to assess the true, um, the true status of somebody who might have hepatitis B or might not be, have hepatitis B. So I want to dive a little bit into the Hepatitis B Screening and Vaccine Advisory Council. This was a council of about 35 to 40 participants who were comprised of public health professionals, various providers, medical societies, federal agencies, and hepatitis B experts from across the nation. And they were tasked with a few different things in order to really identify uh, what's going on with hepatitis B with these new recommendations and how we can make them most successful. So the first was to review recommendations and research for what recently came out. So the new screening guidelines and the new uh, vaccination guidelines. The second was to share findings and personal experience with working in the various settings that they did. As I mentioned, this was a very diverse council. So they all had really unique experiences uh, professionally and they knew what was happening in the different communities that they were working in and have a lot of great insight. And finally, their uh, the final task was to identify opportunities to improve implementation. So they had three major goals that uh, really went into the creation of this white paper. The first was to engage key stakeholders uh, for the new screening and vaccine recommendations. The second was to develop implementation strategies for universal recommendations for the diverse stakeholders. And three was to promote the new recommendations and identify strategies. And all of these goals were really essential and we put a focus and emphasis on the diverse stakeholders because we're moving from risk-based to um, universal. So that means that a lot of groups who were not previously involved in the hepatitis B space as much as they might have wanted to be, or just did not participate in it as frequently as some other groups did, uh, really kind of were starting from zero when it came to these hepatitis B recommendations. So getting them involved, getting them aware was really the first step in this process in making sure that we had specific strategies for these groups who might not be as familiar with hepatitis B as others was essential as well. So the ultimate mission of this white paper and of the council was to improve adult hepatitis B vaccination and screening rates by helping providers to successfully implement the new recommendation in practice. And that's why we have Lisa and Sue on the line today to talk a little bit about how they've been um, working on implementing these two guidelines in practice. So first the group, uh, the, the council, excuse me, looked at challenges uh, that were going into these recommendations. So they separated the challenges by five different groups and five different settings. So community groups identified the ability to follow up with individuals, funding, establishing integrated services, and the limited capacity as their major uh, barriers to implementing vaccination and screening in their settings. Primary care mentioned low provider and patient awareness around hepatitis B in general as barriers, in addition to the differences in the recommendations themselves. So um, screening, as I mentioned, is universal 18 and over, whereas there is a cutoff date at age 59 for universal vaccination. And so it makes it a little bit more difficult to just simply go ahead and integrate that into primary care settings. Uh, additionally, they identified adult immunization information structures as a barrier as sometimes um, a person's vaccination status won't carry across state lines if they move. Sometimes they're not updated as frequently as possible. And it can make it difficult to assess where a person is um, in their immunization, especially with a two to three dose vaccine. Hospitals identified EHR platforms and a lack of champions as being a barrier uh, to universal vaccination and screening. 
uh, EHR platforms have to be updated. And sometimes if a hospital in such a large setting doesn't have a champion to encourage the hospital to uptake um, these new recommendations and go ahead and update them in a timely manner, it might fall to the wayside. In pharmacy settings, uh, there are a couple different uh, barriers that I'll let Lisa talk about, but for the council, they identified a clinic versus being called a pharmacy as a significant barrier. The fact that screening supplies and reimbursement might not happen or be available in our pharmacies and the fact that it is a blood draw for hepatitis B um, in the current moment. Public awareness, uh, low public awareness of hepatitis B in general means that patients are not coming in and seeking information about it in pharmacy settings and also widespread vaccine fatigue from pharmacists themselves and patients, especially as we enter this post-COVID era. And finally, for corrections and substance use services, there were a couple of major issues as well, with the number one being the fact that in many of these settings, uh, infectious diseases and behavioral health care are siloed. So if someone is seeking one service, even if they might be at risk for the other, they might not be uh, getting that service because they're not working together. And there's also a limited, uh, limited facilities have in-house viral hepatitis services. So that means even if they are at risk, they might have to refer a person out if the facility does not have viral hepatitis services. And that is a loss of contact and the person might not actually follow up with that care. So the council broke down their findings into three key priority action items. The first being to educate stakeholders about disease, disease burden and new recommendations. The second was to explore multi-stakeholder collaborations with technology. And the third was to address vaccine hesitancy. So the best practice section of our white paper focuses on a few key items and we also focused on the best practices in action where we had uh, insight from three groups primary care hospital settings and community-based settings with federal funding that uh, went ahead and shared their experiences and how they've been working to implement these new different recommendations within their actual settings so uh, to start off with the council found that messaging is absolutely essential when we're talking about broadening these recommendations to new communities and to uh, the widespread general public, we really wanna focus on talking about how the vaccine is routine now, it is safe and it is effective. Um, the messaging really depends upon your audience. So we have to capture the providers, the public and higher risk groups when we're talking about uh, the new recommendations as well. So for providers, we found that elimination and kind of being a part of this push to eliminate viral hepatitis by 2030 was a successful message for uh, many providers who had not previously been involved in the hepatitis B space. For the public, really focusing on the fact that hepatitis B screening and hepatitis B vaccination is cancer prevention was a very successful message. A lot of people do not associate hepatitis B with liver cancer. And so pushing that message out there and making sure people are well aware that you can prevent cancer is a very strong uh, messaging for a lot of people. And the fact that anybody can be at risk, time and time again, we often hear people separate themselves um, from hepatitis B saying that they couldn't be at risk, they don't do A, B, and C, or and so on and so forth. And the reality is that that's a lot of these things are misinformation that they've heard about hepatitis B, and they're truly really unaware of the fact that they might have a risk themselves. So talking about how they can be at risk, that's exactly why this is now a routine immunization and a, a routine screening schedule um, are really important messages to get across. And the higher risk groups messaging can be variable based upon your community. Every community uh, from high risk has different things that they might resonate with, whether it's um, a drug use community, Asian American, Pacific Islander, so on and so forth. Uh, they all have key messages, which a lot of our groups might work in, that uh, will feel very strong to them. So being aware of the who you're talking to is absolutely essential. And finally, when it comes to messaging, we wanna be consistent on a national, local and community wide basis. Uh, there's a lot of different messages that are out there for hepatitis B, for vaccination, for getting tested for different things. So if you can try to work your messaging into one of the wider national, national messages, for example, routine safety and effectiveness of this vaccination, 
plus the messages that you want to get to your specific community, that will really help uh, the message go much further. Collaboration was the second item that was very important to the council. And this was really big for the provider perspective and making sure providers were well aware of these recommendations and engaged. So co collaboration with clinical training programs, providing hospital grand rounds and developing interprofessional continuing education were all methods that the council identified as being successful and working towards um, getting the messaging across for these two recommendations and then making sure that the providers can go ahead and implement them successfully. In terms of uh, vaccination, one thing that the council found was really helpful was collaborations with state and local health departments and state and local clinics for vaccine delivery. Um, a lot of community-based groups and others who might work in the hepatitis B space and provide screening might not be able to provide uh, the vaccine side of things. And so with these two recommendations, being able to capture somebody exactly where they are, for both, of the, um, both of these recommendations at once is really, really helpful. So by partnering with other groups and collaborating with groups who might provide one service uh, while you provide the other will be really successful in making sure these recommendations are uh, implemented successfully. And finally, technology was a large part of what um, the council talked about and making it as easy as possible. So as I mentioned before, EHR systems are, are very helpful for uh, these larger health systems in making sure that the patient is aware of what's going on and the provider as well. And also using mobile access vaccine cards, such as what was done um, during the COVID um, time period where everybody pretty much had access to a vaccine card on their phone was really simple. So tracking the vaccine was, uh, was uh, one of the strategies that was identified as successful. And I think one of the key messages that was most important to the council was that screening should not be a barrier to vaccination and that vaccination should not be a barrier to screening. Although it's very important to have these two recommendations done, um, we understand that it's not feasible in every single setting. So making sure that if you are able to provide one service, you refer somebody to the other will be critical in um, making sure these vaccine, rec vaccine and screening recommendations work together. And finally, we understand that implementation will take time, but it must start somewhere. So that really is why we're here today, making sure that everybody together is well aware of these recommendations um, and can work on finding strategies and solutions to making sure they're successful in our communities. And so I just wanted to quickly share the way that we end our white paper is with a few different resources that we've heard have been helpful from a provider perspective. Um, we understand that um, many providers see there's a little bit of confusion with the different uh, vaccines that are available for hepatitis B and that they might not understand where to find some specific information for their groups, uh, specific groups that they work with them. So we uh, put together uh, this nice chart on the left side and direct links to all of the resources, including standing order templates for vaccines, a primary care guidance on hepatitis B, diagnosis, treatment, and management, um, and resources from other groups as well. Um, so all of this will be linked uh, down below in the white paper and accessible to everyone. So with that, I can actually stop sharing and turn it over to Lisa to talk a little bit about implementation uh, within a pharmacy setting. Thanks, Michaela. Let me share my screen here. Maybe. There we go. Can we see it? Great. So um, thank you for that introduction briefly. Um, my name is Lisa and I am a pharmacist with Spartan Nash. Um, Michaela covered a lot of information. That was also something that I was going to cover. So for the sake of time, because I Really am excited to hear um, what Sue has to share with us today. I'm gonna fly through a few slides um, just so that we can stay on time and, and get to the Q&A. So, okay. So as mentioned, I'm Lisa, that's my fancy headshot. Uh, this is what I look like in real life. Um, I am a pharmac pharmacist that practices in ambulatory care, um, as well as I manage the Spartan Nash pharmacy-based immunization program. 
So who is Spartan Nash? Um, we are a Midwest regional grocer and wholesaler. We currently operate 84 pharmacies across Michigan, Indiana, Wisconsin, Minnesota, Iowa, Nebraska, and South Dakota. We employ over 17,000 associates. We have 145 corporate owned retail stores and serve 2,100 independent retailers. We also have 20 distribution centers. So a little bit about our immunization efforts um, to date, specifically about our pharmacy-based immunization program. Um, the WHO are our pharmacy immunizers. So we employ immunization certified pharmacists, pharmacy technicians, and pharmacy students. Um, I have shared with you on this slide some of the requirements, training, and education that are, re that are necessary for our pharmacy immunizers. I'm not going to read through this information um, for you, but this is not an all-inclusive list by any means either. Um, we do very much um, are a proponent for our immunizers remaining up to date on, on the service being rendered, as well as um, continuing to educate themselves specific to immunization. So one thing that I will call attention to is we do have an annual organization-wide required continuing education specific to immunizations that all of our pharmacy immunizers must complete. So what immunizations do we provide in our pharmacies? Um, the list is here, and these are administered pursuant to a current um, collaborative practice agreement or CPA, also known as a signed physician protocol. Um, as you can see, we do um, administer the hepatitis B vaccine, as well as the hepatitis A and B combination vaccine product. We do immunize persons down to age five um, or as allowed by the specific state law and or board of pharmacy rules and regulations. So where are these immunizations provided? Um, in my mind, these fall into two separate buckets, those being um, at our actual pharmacy, so the outpatient retail-based pharmacy, as well as immunization clinics. Um, as far as the outpatient retail-based pharmacies go, I would like to point out that approximately one half of our pharmacy locations are in rural communities, which is something that we're um, quite proud about, I guess, um, because it just really helps address some of the equity issues that we're currently experiencing. So in our outpatient retail-based pharmacies, um, we do have patient appointment opportunities. We also encourage walk-ins and we welcome walk-ins. I think that this is very important. So an appointment can be a barrier for um, receiving a vaccine for some people. And walk-ins are sort of those impromptu conversations in which we identify that a patient is eligible to receive a recommended immunization. And maybe they're not planning to get it that day, but they are willing to receive it that day. So that really allows us to immunize at the point of recognition that somebody is due, which does help us further um, meet these universal recommendations for hepatitis B. In terms of an immunization clinic, we do provide on-site clinics. So these might be a retail store event for our store employees or the persons visiting our store locations. We also encourage each of our um, retail-based pharmacies to provide an off-site clinic. So this is where they have to think outside the box a little bit, um, thinking about employers in their community, as well as other community events where we may have persons eligible to receive immunizations coming to that event. And again, not maybe anticipating receiving it, but are open to receiving it because we've made it easy and accessible. Um, for both of these situations, we really encourage our pharmacy staff to identify all immunization opportunities. And we're gonna talk a little bit more about that as we talk about how we have tried to work to overcome some of the barriers. So when do we immunize? Um, this might seem like a silly slide, but historically some pharmacy um, based programs have really focused on a seasonality approach to immunizations, really, really focusing and, and marketing towards flu season or in the last few years, COVID-19 vaccine. Um, we actually strive to be a vaccine destination for the communities we serve. And so we like to think about immunizing all year round. So we actually encourage our pharmacy immunizers to be seeking out those opportunities on a daily basis, January through December. So one might say, why does Spartan Nash have such a vested interest in pharmacy-based immunizations? Um, we uh, have as an organization what we like to call our winning recipe. Um, four of these things, the four highlighted items are parts of that winning recipe. And I've identified how we have worked 
our pharmacy-based immunization program into these. So um, as an organization, we seek to create solutions. Um, in the United States, pharmacy locations are readily accessible. Um, most Americans are living within five miles of a community pharmacy. As I mentioned, on, over half of our pharmacies are actually located in a rural community that we may be the only pharmacy in their area. Um, so that really makes us accessible to help achieve these um, immunization goals and initiatives. We also seek to put people first, um, and I think that we achieve this through the promotion of health equity and overall well-being. And finally, as an organization, we serve and we seek to win. So by serving, we're providing immunizations, and we win by decreasing and preventing the presence of these vaccine-preventable diseases. So this, these next couple of slides, again, for the sake of time, I'm going to just kind of skim over these briefly. But um, they cover the, the new universal recommendations for hepatitis B. So Michaela covered this. We um, are well aware of what the current recommendations are. We now know that hepatitis B vaccination is recommended for all adults 19 through 59 and adults age 60 years of older with risk factors. We know that persons age 60 years and older without known risk factors may also receive the hepatitis B vaccine. And we should be and hopefully are encouraging all infants and children aged less than 19 years of age to receive their hepatitis B vaccines. This slide um, goes over the rationale from the CDC specifically on why the change in recommendations. Michaela did a great job of covering this with you earlier in her um, her presentation looking specifically at the statistics um, and the concerning rise in hepatitis B infection in the US, specifically in that key uh, age range of 30 to 49 years of age. Um, so the hope was by removing that risk factor assessment, we increase vaccination coverage and decrease hepatitis B cases. So how has um, the uptake been in our pharmacies with regard to the universal vaccine recommendations? Um, honestly, it's been marginal. Um, so we're going to just spend a few, a few minutes talking about some of the barriers we've encountered um, as a team. And Michaela also touched on a lot of these already. And I think it's really fascinating that the white paper also identified a lot of these things. Um, so our success has been marginal, but that's not despite our best efforts. So one of the barriers we identified and Michaela hit on this was the lack of perceived risk and benefit. On the left, I've outlined the, the well-known risk factors that used to be the risk factors that we would use to screen for whether or not you should receive the hepatitis B vaccine series. Um, we too believe that this risk is largely underestimated and underreported. Again, we identified as a team that this is likely due to some social stigma and potential uncom uncomfortable conversations between a recipient or someone who is eligible and the pharmacist. Um, there's also this surge of misinformation and lack of education on how and one might be exposed or infected with hepatitis B. Um, you know, we think about uh, diabetes and assisted blood glucose monitoring. Um, we think about traveling and, and possibly, unfortunately, getting into a, you know, an accident in a country in which their health system is not the United States or doesn't have the same criteria for cleanliness. These are all things that um, one may not think they're at risk for hepatitis B, but when we really sit and think about it, um, the reality is we might truly be at risk. These are other barriers that we've identified. Um, lack of a targeted media presence and promotion. Um, we have seen the commercials for Shingrix and the COVID-19 vaccine, but unfortunately we haven't seen a whole, uh, a whole lot come out on the, the who should receive hepatitis B and why were the change in the recommendations made. And so there really hasn't been a lot of um, news or media presence about this. Um, Michaela hit on this as well, but the gaps in vaccine documentation I'm in that age group and I still have the tattered card of all of the childhood IMS that I received. Um, my Hep B series is on there, but a lot of people have no idea where that card is or if it even still exists. So um, we're talking through patients about, um, you know, did you receive this? Do you have the card? And then really having that conversation about if we can't find proof of vaccination, that it really truly is not harmful to receive another series if need be. These are important things that we have to start having the conversations about. Um, Michaela hit on this too, but I saw this personally in my practice, the decreased awareness among other healthcare professionals, 
Um, I can remember when, when these recommendations went live and all of a sudden in Epic, um, my providers were coming to me saying, do you know why this recommendation is flagging as necessary on my patient? Um, and, and at that time, having that conversation with them about the new changes to the universal recommendations and how important it is. Um, there still exists a misconception of who should receive the hepatitis B vaccine series and when they should receive this. Um, and finally, the tighter recommendations, um, we believe may lead to some vaccine hesitancy and decreased confidence. We know that this is only for select patient populations. Um, however, in a time right now where people are questioning if they need to receive all of these vaccines, why are we receiving these vaccines? If I need a titer, does it truly work? Um, being armed with that, uh, that education and, and being able to have that conversation is, is very critical. One barrier for us, oops, sorry, I'll just, I know what that slide is. The one barrier for us that we encountered too is the immunocompromised population. Um, so our current standing order set reads that um, due to um, those persons possibly requiring a, a more doses than necessary in this recommended serology testing, our pharmacists and pharmacy immunizers are encouraged to speak with the provider managing that disease state um, to determine how best to immunize that person against hepatitis B. So we are looking forward to maybe some further guidance coming with that specific patient population, but I wanted to call that out as a barrier for us implementing fully at this point in time. So tips and tools for success for us. Um, these are things that we have determined work well for our pharmacy immunizers and have helped us um, vaccinate more persons. So first and foremost is use of uh, the state immunization registries. Michaela hinted at the use of vaccine cards. Um, we actually rely heavily on our state immunization registries. We actually strongly encourage each of our pharmacy immunizers and pharmacists to consistently use and check available state registries for immunization opportunities with each unique um, patient that enters the pharmacy. This not only identifies those who are in need of the hepatitis B series, but other immunizations as well. Um, for us, we encourage asking and offer, offering an immunization to each and every person. Um, for our organization, this is an expectation, not an exception. So I provided an example of some of the language that we have shared with our pharmacists and pharmacy team members to have with patients, just really encouraging them to ask, hey, did you know that this is recommended for you? It, re it appears you haven't received this today. I have a dose ready for you. Do you have a few minutes to get it? Um, making this an expectation that the person's going to take you up on the offer, not, eh, do you really want, you know, putting it back in their court. If we are able to confidently make them feel comfortable, um, answer their questions, they are definitely more likely to receive that vaccine um, and go about their day. We also encourage an alternative for scheduling if needed. So if this person does not have the time that day, um, sharing with them that you know, hey, every Friday I host a two hour vaccine clinic. Can I put you down at 10 a.m. to come back and get that dose is incredibly helpful. Taking the responsibility out of the patient's hands to main, you know, manage and remember to come back is um, very helpful and has led to immunization success. We like to make the process and procedure simple, safe, thorough, and efficient. I don't think there's a whole lot to expand upon with this topic. Um, this has been proven for us to be effective, again, with hepatitis B vaccination and other vaccines as well. Um, we do arm our pharmacy immunizers with the education tips and tools to be successful, confident, and comfortable in their recommendations. So we do encourage the use of role play and practicing immunization recommendations with patients. Um, I like to think of, of the time spent with someone in your vaccine chair as um, sort of that time where you have them there and a captive audience to advocate for other vaccines and the prevention of disease. Um, we encourage our pharmacy immunizers to bring other recommended vaccine products like the hepatitis B vaccine products with them to other immunization clinic opportunities. So in that flu season, in that COVID-19 clinic, um, bringing along the hepatitis B vaccine and, and getting that done at the same time as the others has been very beneficial. 
We like to encourage our pharmacy immunizers to be present, open, honest, and respectful, understanding that there is no personal right or wrong, um, and, and knowing that it's our ethical, moral, and professional obligation to provide the accurate research-based education each and every time. Um, we have found that determining what is of value to a vaccine recipient or to an individual is very important in whether or not these recommendations are um, you know, taken up on. So this um, might be, is it international travel? Is it volunteering in their community? Um, is it their work or spending time playing a sport? It's a little bit trickier with hepatitis B just given the risk factors that we're all used to. Um, and, you know, we see the headlines for hepatitis A and we know that that's spread through food. Um, but when you think about hepatitis B and how that's contracted, I think historically a lot of people think, well, that's not me. I don't do those things. But again, as Michaela mentioned, we know that that's not necessarily true, um, nor is that the only way that one can contract hepatitis B. And then use of helpful resources. We use the same helpful resources that Michaela shared with you, um, leaning into the CDC, immunize.org and Hepatitis B Foundation. Another way that we have worked to overcome is to increase awareness and provide education. Um, to the healthcare providers, we actually have a team of embedded ambulatory care pharmacists. Um, each of those individuals have, have done a great job in speaking with their primary care teams that they work closely with, with encouraging um, the universal vaccine recommendations for HEP B. Um, and then as far as our recipients in community, just really having those conversations about acknowledging the previous recommendations, the new recommendations, the reason for the change, and the health risks associated with hepatitis B, such as liver cancer and uh, cirrhosis. Um, we work to build vaccine confidence um, through encouragement, understanding, and sharing those personal vaccine stories. And another tip that we've had success with is lunch and learn opportunities in a workplace. Um, so not maybe vaccinating at this event, but going in with that education of why um, universal, universal hep B immunization is important and why when we come back with the vaccine, it would be great if you came and paid us a visit so we could start your series. Those have been successful. Do encourage our pharmacy teams to think outside the box. Um, how can we encourage our communities to, to receive this series? Where is there a need? Um, how, and then most important is how can you be creative, fun, and promote health all in one? So thinking about things that are going on in your community, um, maybe there's an event where you're going to have a lot of people gathering. And again, if you don't bring the vaccine with you, thinking about how you can promote these recommendations and really encourage people to come and seek you out um, in the future to start their series. Um, we definitely always ensure that the next dose is scheduled and do our best to provide a reminder notification. This is key in order for them to receive all of those doses that are recommended for their series dependent on the product they're receiving. Um, so making sure that we encourage them to come back when they need to come back so we can complete that is, is critical to our success. And then always, always, always documenting. Um, so we now do have a, a requirement and we do document each and every vaccine, including hepatitis B um, into our state registries. Um, and this is done, we have the expectation that these are done within 24 hours. So the hope is that that patient entering any other point in the health system in their state of residence will be able to see that. Michaela did point on something that is definitely important in the state of Michigan. I can say that we're also working on that is how do we move forward with making those state registries flow between different states so that if someone is transient, if someone is moving, we can see all of that information. Um, the state of Michigan is, is currently playing with that as well. Um, so hopefully we can make some, uh, make some ground there. So we had a call to action too. This is before I saw Michaela's slides, so it's pretty exciting. Um, so what are we doing moving onward? Um, we have uh, pharmacies, pharmacists, and pharmacy immunizers um, definitely are an accessible destination to receive these IMS, um, including the hepatitis B series. And as an organization, we're gonna continue to do this work. Um, we are gonna continue to promote the receipt of the hepatitis B vaccine series and hopefully improve the health of the persons that um, live in the communities that we serve. Um, I do have a slide for questions, but we're gonna do that at the end. So with that, uh, I'm going to roll it over to Sue because I, 
I'm really interested in what she has to share with us. So thank you. Thank you, Lisa. Well, that was so thorough and comprehensive. I think a lot of the tips you gave actually are like right on the spot for primary care and for happy screening as well. So, um, so, so yeah, you did a lot of the heavy lifting already. But I'll <laughs> share. Um, let me get my slides going, and I'll share about implementation and integration of the screening part. So let me get to slide. All right, good. You guys all see this? All right, so this is an exciting time, obviously, and I think those of us in the hepatitis um, community and who do advocacy are really um, eager to see the impact of uh, these new universal screening recommendations. And I think while they're out there by CDC and it's visible, I think the other, the second part, which is you know really important is the uptake and the implementation. So talks like this and projects and, um, initiatives, I think, to really get this in practice and operationalize it are going to be really important. So this, again, was the call to action. If you haven't what, read the white paper, or Michaela did a great job summarizing it, but the link is um, here, and I'm sure it's being shared through Happy United. So just a little background about myself and the practice that I'm in. I'm the medical director for the Center for Asian Health. Um, we are based in New Jersey, northern New Jersey, in um, uh, Livingston, uh, is where the hospital is. My practice is in Florham Park. And why do we have an Asian health program? Well, New Jersey has the fourth largest Asian population in the U.S. Um, one in 10 Asians, um, New Jersey residents actually identify as Asian. Um, and so our goal was really to set up a, um, a practice. And we're a comprehensive primary care practice uh, that's part of a larger healthcare system when we launched in 2013. And our mission is to provide culturally responsive medical care, address health disparities in Asians, increase community health awareness through education and screenings, and link our patients to a network of providers and services throughout our system um, and beyond, especially if they need in-language services, we can identify doctors who speak the same language as them. Um, and on top of all the clinical work that we do, we also conduct a lot of community-based outreach and also research, and we collaborate with a number of partners, including the health department, uh, universities, and community organizations like uh, Chinese associations or language schools, um, all with the goal to really advance um, healthcare um, services to the Asian community and ultimately to advance kind of knowledge um, and, uh, and, and quality of care um, affecting uh, diverse communities. So this is a, a flyer kind of of our practice and you see we've got a number of primary care doctors and we've got uh, uh, specialists that rotate. They don't, they're not permanently at our office but they may come once a, once a month or twice a month to provide services. And we have a navigator who's uh, actually quite important in terms of helping patients um, get to services and care um, to us or to other specialists. All right, so where, where are, I guess, integration points um, of how we can integrate both hep B screening and vaccination? So first off is primary care, which I think is kind of um, what everybody is thinking, like this is now a place for us to shift out of uh, specialist um, care, but also just to make sure that hepatitis B is recognized as an important um, condition to screen for in primary care. And so uh, the way we do it here, and um, I used to work at, many of you may, may know me from my work at Charles B. Wong Community Health Center, which is the FQHC in Chinatown, which I'll, in New York City, which I'll talk a little bit about later. And so there, because our population was largely Asian, it made sense to kind of do universal screening. Um, but over time, I've come to see that this is actually an important kind of infection, infectious disease screening for all of my new patients as part of preventative care services. And so when I get a new patient, I just basically will say, you know, as part of your baseline um, tests, you know, being a new patient is we do a panel for infectious disease screening um, that includes these four, HIV, Hep A, and Hep B, and Hep C. And that way there's no risk profiling. I don't have to ask a lot of questions. And this we've seen is actually much more effective, this universal approach than trying to risk stratify. So many of you will remember the way the CDC guidelines looked before this universal. And it was like, I would have two slides of like long lists of like, you know, somebody was on dialysis if somebody, um, you know, had multiple sex partners or this and this. And it was almost really difficult for a physician to kind of remember all these categories. So now Hep B has followed the way of HIV and Hepatitis C, which is a one-time screening test. And this just makes a lot of sense. Um, Lisa also brought up a really good point 
is to really position this as a liver cancer screening. So oftentimes we'll talk about, um, make sure they know that liver cancer is one of the, um, a hepatitis, I mean, is one of the leading causes of, uh, of liver cancer globally, and the majority of people have yet to be diagnosed. So liver health is also, so a lot of people are concerned and understand that things like fatty liver. Um, and so we'll talk about how screening for hepatitis is a way of kind of improving their liver health. Um, and of course, we do hepatitis B vaccine in our clinic as well. So we will test for hepatitis B. And if somebody is not immune, uh, we will give them the vaccine. So in addition to this, we do community initiatives such as health fairs. We have special testing days. So May 19th, as many of you know, is hepatitis testing day in the US. Um, July is hepatitis awareness month and July 28th is world hepatitis day. So we, we often will set up testing days for those days too. And I would encourage all of you guys to think about partnering um, with people in your community. So some of our very successful partnerships are actually with health departments. Health departments often have health fairs for seniors. They'll do flu, flu testing days, or they will do certain days where they do um, uh, screenings. And so we will actually come alongside them and provide a phlebotomist and do hepatitis B testing. Um, and I'll talk a little bit about the coupons we've offered in the past, and we've uh, done vaccinations um, in the community too. So, and then also really interestingly is our collaborations with our hospital. So we are now doing hepatitis B and C screening um, in our ED and inpatient settings. And I'll talk about that. Uh, we have a liver center, which we've kind of set up as a virtual liver center between us and the hospital. We provide the outpatient care. We have a hepatologist. Um, and then we recently started working with our pharmacist. So um, Lisa, I think you had mentioned this a little bit about like the pharmacy committee. So because they know we do a lot of hepatitis B work, um, I was invited to sit on the hepatitis B, I mean, on the, the formulary committee. So, and I know you probably have seen this happen, like the formulary, people are deciding, you know, do we add the Heplosav to, to the three dose vaccines? And this is a nice way for us to utilize our expertise, right? So they invited me to sit on the pharmacy committee and uh, we went over the data. And then it just was like, once you go over the data, it becomes like a clear call, like, oh, this makes sense. A lot of patients would actually really prefer to have a two dose vaccine, you know, finished in a month and three doses. Um, and so this has been really nice because this actually ends up impacting our employee health too. As many of you know, um, before you start working at a hospital, you often will get tested. You know, they want to know whether you've been vaccinated for Hep B, and they may do a serology test too. So it's another opportunity to kind of make sure that the healthcare uh, workforce, which is actually considered a high risk, you know, in terms of being exposed to uh, blood and um, other bodily fluids and make sure that they're actually protected um, by getting vaccines. So I'm not gonna go through this, but we know that CDC has recommended this triple test. So making sure everybody gets um, surface antigen antibody and I mean, surface antibody and core antibody. And I always tell people these charts are available. You just have to Google them they're on CDC's website for interpretation. Um, and uh, that's important just for people to know. Uh, these are just some photos of like the community work that we do and some pictures of Chinese Wellness Day, which is our annual health fair that we do. Um, working with the Chinese community, we do a lot of work in the Chinese media and we have ads and um, we actually put our hepatitis B coupon inside the newspaper too. Um, and we often will build Hep B inside other things. So people may not come out just for Hep B testing, but may, we may add on a, a hypertension testing or a glucose testing or throw in a talk. And so I think when you kind of um, include other services, it becomes a more comprehensive type approach to getting people engaged. So it's just a photo of our, our coupon. And so this was basically, we worked with our, um, our phlebotomy. And so a lot of hospitals will have like outpatient lab centers. And so as long as we actually indicated what test it was and the order code and who the ordering doctor was, which was me, and we had a, we were able to get a small grant to cover the test, then we could actually provide this like a lab slip, like what you would get from your doctor. And so I've seen this done in other places. Happy United in Philly, I think, has this kind of model as well. So just something to consider. And for anybody who gets community testing, we then send them a letter um, with their results. Um, if they are if they are hepatitis B positive, then we have somebody contact them and make sure that they're aware that they need to get care. All right, and then in terms of our hospital initiative, so we started doing um, this focus group testing where we have been testing people for Hep B if they're from a 
endemic country of birth. Now that we have new guidelines, we can actually follow in the way of Hep C and do make it a one-time universal test. So Hep C, as many of you know, was birth cohort testing until about 2020, 2021, and then they switched also to universal testing, uh, which makes it a lot easier, honestly, in terms of the, these automation um, protocols that we do. So you will see these signs inside our hospital, basically saying that our hospital provides Hep B and Hep C testing as part of like best practices. We worked with our IT team to kind of come together, come up with a protocol that the um, that our uh, that our EMR follows. So this was uh, Cerner originally, and now we're switching to Epic. So we've had to reprogram this um, for for Epic. And so in addition to for Hep B was um, endemicity of the country that they're from. And also if there was any kind of urine toxicology or serum toxicology test, we would also add it on. So what did we find? Um, I mean, what this showed to me is that really when you scale up through automation, the numbers are much higher. So when we did our CDC, we had a CDC grant where we did a lot of health fairs and um, we, 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 we got a decent number of numbers, but nothing to the kind of scale that you do when you automate it. So for just for four years, we've been able to screen almost 40,000 people for hepatitis B. Um, and we found almost a 1% uh, positivity rate, which is quite high. As you know, nationally, it's about 0.3 to 0.4%. Um, so just showing the national, international diversity um, in our population. And we've been able to get most people linked to care also. All right. And the other key thing is just making sure that we have good care transitions. So the testing happens in the hospital or the emergency room. The patient navigator receives the result, calls the patient, and then basically is able to get them appointments into our practice, which is called full floor and product multi-specialty. Um, and the primary care doctor is able to follow the patient. Uh, we, we have a pharmacist that works with patients. Um, it's usually been more of an issue to get hep C treatment, but even for hep B treatment, sometimes if they need the, the patient assistance plan or something else, our pharmacists are hugely helpful for that. I really encourage, you know, not everybody will be able to have a pharmacist in their practice, but definitely find some local community pharmacists um, in your area. I mean, they, you know, I feel like they just do, they do an amazing job in terms of um, helping patients kind of be able to get their medications on time. So, and then what's been interesting is just kind of seeing the diversity of patients that we serve here. So this is just looking at the countries that are represented um, through our testing. And if we hadn't collected country of origin, we would have never known that like we had so many Haitian patients because um, they would have just shown up by race as African-American. Um, and so you can't always tell what countries people are from if you're looking just at race and not country of origin. So this has been, what we tell people is this is a kind of um, community needs assessment and a way to kind of reach your community. Um, and uh, personalized medicine is another way of kind of thinking about it. So I'm just gonna, the rest of the time, I'm just gonna show really quick screenshots from different places. No matter what EMR you have, there is some way to modify it so that you can do kind of more universal type have B screening. So I used to work at CBW. Um, they had uh, centricity. So you can see there's a place that auto populates the vaccines. This is important to have, you know, all the preventative maintenance, preventative care stuff. Um, so you could see the last dates and the test results right below it for HEP B. Um, and then in preventative care, they're basically like reminders if people need things. And then all the HEP B tests are kind of put together in one place. Um, so these are pretty easy things to modify no matter what EMR you have. Next, this is opposite coast in um, Oakland. This is Northeast Medical Services um, and they have next gen. So you have, you can see where here they have put in um, HEP B results. So you can see if somebody has been tested or not and what their result is. And then um, similarly, they have their groups, their lab tests all grouped together for hepatitis B. And this is kind of the da daily dashboard for a patient. So if the doctor basically has the whole list of all the patients they're seeing that day, right away they can see which patients have been screened. There's a column here that says yes, 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 and whether who needs vaccination. So this is important if you're a part of kind of the decision-making for these dashboards to kind of include HEPI in these dashboards. And then finally, my healthcare system medical group. So we had CERN number four, we just switched over to EPIC. And Cerner, the issue of the ambulatory version we had is that we could not make any major modifications. Like I could not do what we did at Charles B. Wong and you know, completely make a different HEP B kind of flow sheet um, because it would have to do, be done nationally. We didn't have any dedicated IT team to make modifications. But 
even without that, we're able to kind of group all our labs together ourselves. So usually you can create your own favorites, even within your lab orders or your favorite diagnosis. And so I would always make sure like my HEPI panel uh, was close to each other um, so that I wouldn't forget to order some of these tests. So, and then our flow sheet, and this is like pretty, usually the flow sheets have all the HEPI tests uh, put together anyway. So that's it, just some ideas. You know, I think there's a million ways people can kind of integrate and I um, encourage people to be champions kind of wherever you are and work with your colleagues in different departments. The IT, you know, department is huge and, you know, it's been helpful to also, as we work with them, also tell them like how important of an initiative this is globally and that they're making a difference in HEPI elimination. And I think a lot of them appreciate kind of knowing they're making a difference um, in people's lives, right? They don't often get to see patients directly, but we can share with them um, the kind of global impact that this is having. So I will close there. Thank you. Great. Thank you so much, uh, Michaela, Lisa, and Sue. Um, I'm Rhea with Hepatitis B Foundation, and we do have just a few minutes for questions. I saw that there are a lot coming in, a couple that were already answered in the box. You can go back and check to see. And just to note, since we won't get through all of the questions, we will try to answer more of them via the follow-up email, if that helps. Um, so I wanted to start with, there was a question that I think may, we may take to Lisa first. So there was somebody who mentioned um, living in a state where people travel in and out a, a lot and you can only really see the registry um, for somebody's vaccination history within that state. And mm -hmm. so most people don't remember, keep their vaccines written down. Um, is there a way to check for with other states about screening history? Screening history or vaccine history? Probably um, vaccine history. Oh, actually, it looks like they were maybe both, maybe vaccination or both. Okay. both. <laughs> yeah, that's OK. <laughs> um, so so that's a, a great question. So the question was, is there a way to see state to state differences with regards to vaccination registry? Um, as I mentioned previously, I know that in the state of Michigan, we are working. Um, one thing that I do know that we have for Michigan specifically, and again, I can't speak to the other states, um, is um, the ability for a patient to have their own login into their own registry. Um, so what that, what that means is a patient can actually um, create the login and log in and see their registry. They can't make any edits or changes to it, but they actually can use that as a, as a documentation tool to take with them um, when they're traveling or, or when they're you know, going to another state or residing someplace else. Um, we as providers also have the ability to print that and sign and date it. And that is also a, a, a legal um, vaccine. It better than others. California did a fantastic job with like COVID vaccine documentation. Over here, we're still rocking the paper cards. And so some people will come and they have five different COVID cards. Um, so I think we can make several improvements. And I hope that that taught us that as a, as a country, we need to work on something more standard. Um, but that is what I know to be true for right now. All right. Thank you. It's helpful. Mm -hmm. um, if I could just try to squeeze in one question for Sue. Um, can you talk a little bit more about getting physicians on board with the triple testing panel and also driving this the update with hospital labs? So funny, I was just starting to type that in. So that's, oh, you a, were. Okay. that's a great question because I think there's a lot that, it sounds like whoever asked this question maybe works for the hospital lab, um, but it's a great way to, to, to have the lab actually help out because they can actually create a panel and then label it hepatitis B screening panel. I haven't include the three tests. I think the issue is that when you give people just a menu of hep B tests, it is overwhelming. Um, and you have the e-antigen test that gets thrown in there, which we don't need for screening. You have the core IgM, um, which unless the patient you're worried about them having acute hepatitis, you don't need to order for you know, um, screening. So if you can label that as like screening hepatitis B test, you know, and then put the three tests in, that's very helpful. Um, what we found LabCorp actually did a couple of years ago is um, they created something like this and they actually called it like pre, this is when all the DAs for hep C were being rolled out or like people were worried about reactivation if somebody's on cancer therapy or getting chemo, they would call it like reactivation 
um, test, but it was actually the, th the same three tests. So uh, I think being able to create profiles is really important if you can get those into the, the ordering sets of doctors. Um, and any small practice, you know, can also do this. Doesn't have to be a, a hospital lab that does this, but I think that'll be really critical to, to doing this right. Thank you. And so I think, unfortunately, since we are already at 401, I will hand it back to Michaela for any closing thoughts or other questions that you want to address and follow up. Thank you, guys. Thanks, Andrea. Uh, well, I have certainly learned a lot today, and I think the audience has as well. So Lisa and Sue, thank you so much for providing your expertise um in terms of hepatitis b and screening and vaccine implementation we will follow up with all the questions that we didn't get to in the chat as i mentioned um via email and we will be certain to share the recording and the slides with you all so thank you all for attending today's webinar and i hope you all have a great rest of your day bye